you're joining us for Preventing Violence in Our Homes, Meeting This Moment with Connection, Care, and Justice. This is brought to you by Prevent Connect and Prevention Institute. Prevent Connect is a national project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, sponsored by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided in this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the U.S. government, CDC, or CalCASA. So once again, thank you for joining and welcome. Um, there's over 300 of you on this web conference day, which is um, great, and we're excited to connect with you all. And I um, want to introduce you now to our partners at Prevention Institute. Um, so happy to have you all here with us um, and to hand this over to you. Um, I know you've worked so hard on bringing this conversation um, to us in such a short amount of time. So thank you all. Alicia, Adina, and Lisa, thank you so much for being here. How are all of you today? Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, things are uh, going well considering everything happening in the world it's nice to be here with 310 of you virtually and uh, creating community in this way um, it's a little strange not to be in the same room with my colleagues like we usually are for these um, but abina do you want to introduce yourself yeah thanks alicia hi everyone this is abina coming to you live from oakland california happy to be here today and I'd also like my colleague, um, Lisa, to introduce yourself. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Lisa Fujia Parks, and I'm thrilled to be here. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining the conversation. It's, it's really, truly wonderful to be here together. Um, I want to give a shout out to Prevent Connect, um, celebrating 15 years. Um, I know that many of us on the uh, web conference today have long-standing connections and many of you um, are joining Prevent Connect for the first time. So I'm feeling a lot of gratitude. I'm feeling some tenderness and uh, just feeling so many things. Um, so we wanted to take this moment to acknowledge the magnitude of what each of us might be facing in our lives with our families, with our communities, the country, the entire planet. Um, we know that many of us have lost loved ones or know uh, people who have lost their lives um, in the current pandemic or to other causes and are experiencing stresses and losses and traumas. So we wanted to just ask everyone to take a moment of silence and a few deep breaths um, to support us and nourish us and kind of help us arrive and be present together um, with strength and compassion um, in this moment. So Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Alicia. Um, please go ahead and lay out our objectives for today. Oh, <laughs> and one more slide. Um, we also wanted to just give an acknowledgement to you know all the folks listed here and um, many more who are not listed here um, who are you know supporting our communities, um, providing essential functions for us to all. Um, be able to eat and get the care we need in this moment. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so this web conference today, um, I know all of you read the objectives when you signed up, so I won't go too much into detail about them, but just want to say that um, we're trying to be as solutions and creativity focused as possible, and uh, we have quite a few guests with us. Um, we know that the fear, loss, grief, and the unknown um, is real, um, but at the same time, we're creative and resilient and our families and communities have um, assets, have the power and the solutions uh, for moving forward. So we're hoping that we can engage in a discussion with all of you. Please use the text chat as we go through uh, today's session and let's talk about how we can meet this moment uh, with care, 
uh, connection and justice. So to start us off with this text chatting, um, I wanted to put up this question here and invite you to share what's top of mind for you when you're thinking about this moment and the work that you do. Maybe you want to share why you decided to sign up for this web conference. Um, you know, what's coming up for you? So please share that in the text chat and we'll come back to report out uh, what's coming up. Um, but on our next slide, in the meantime, I wanted to share this graphic and paper from the Center for Global Development. It unpacks pathways between the pandemic and violence against women and children. So we're seeing here on the graphic things like economic insecurity or social isolation are just a couple of the pathways that are discussed here. Um, and so one example is how close quarters, especially those that are tied to stressful situations, are linked to stress, fear, and poor mental health, which can in turn increase the likelihood for um, violence against women and children. You can definitely read the full paper if you want more details um, to learn more about this, but just wanted to illustrate a little bit about how the impacts of the current climate can relate to violence in the home. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa, who's gonna share a bit about masculinities and racial justice. Yeah, so we found this article in the conversation um, helpful for highlighting how um, social and structural and political factors are shaped by gender norms um, to influence many of what much of what we're seeing right now, um, including everything from underlying health conditions, hygiene practices, degrees of or, and ways of being socially connected, the kinds of political solutions that are being advanced and, and more. Um, and we know that gender norms, um, we know that you know, use of power and um, how we find a sense of control and power in our lives is shaped by gender and that potential abuses of power and control over others is shaped by gender norms among many other factors. So we wanted to you know, highlight that. And on the next slide, uh, we also know that um, racial injustice is also shaping what's happening in our communities, um, is always shaping what's happening in our communities. Structural racism and other forms of structural oppression um, have created inequitable community conditions and are root causes of public health and safety problems. We know that black, brown and indigenous communities are being hit hard by the virus as well as other conditions that can increase the risk for violence. Um, and so we're really holding uh, racial justice policies and solutions and, and centering those as well as gender justice and other forms of social justice. On the next slide, um, we also wanted to highlight that there is an evidence base for um, what works to prevent various forms of uh, violence in the home. And um, these are just a few from CDC's tech packages that um, might be helpful to think about with um, adapting to the specifics of what we're facing right now. Thank you, good then. So um, in our web conference title, uh, we include the words connection, care, and justice, which we believe are critical to preventing many forms of violence, whether um, many forms of violence in the home, whether it's child abuse, intimate partner violence, suicide, gun violence, a lot of the things that we've been hearing about um, in the news and experiencing in our communities. And so um, these words are really intentional in the web conference. Title and so just wanted to share a little bit a little bit about them. So connection really has to do, you know, I mentioned social isolation before with the pandemic. And so we really see cohesion and connectedness as a protective factor against violence and to support safety. And I know connection needs to look a little bit differently right now. So we wanted to highlight that. And I saw in the text chat someone had written about uh, how do we engage with people who don't have access to, to the web. So hopefully that's a thread we can continue to discuss. Um, care really has to do with meeting immediate needs um, and how by doing so, we can really decrease family stressors and support safety at home. And justice relates to advocacy, policy, and systems change, really thinking about it um, 
for health equity and racial justice, both right now in the immediate moment and also long term. And with those three themes, uh, we have some emerging actions that we've started to hear about from communities that we're partnering with. So things like groups starting to identify and advocate for uh, the emerging needs that are happening. And some of our guests are gonna talk about this today. Um, we've been hearing about communities trying to support healthy relationships and redefining what healthy relationships might look like during stay at home orders. People are also getting creative about uh, what these social connections can look like, as I mentioned. We've seen a lot of people um, in the field sharing messages of hope, resilience, and self-care, whether it's through group chats or social media or putting things up in apartment complexes. Um, another action that we've been seeing is around uh, confronting racism and xenophobia as public health issues. Uh, just this week, or Starting last week, you know, some of the news reports started to finally apply more of an equity lens and thinking about who's most affected. Um, and there was a lot on African-American and Latino populations. We also know that Asian-Americans have been experiencing um, quite a lot of discrimination um, with this virus. So there's actions to take in that uh, realm as well. And then the last one is around making the case for gun safety. Uh, also been hearing a lot about increases in gun purchases and um, some dealerships um, being able to uh, remain as essential. So thinking about what it what does safe storage look like? Um, how can we really make the case for for gun safety as well? So with that, it seems like a lot of you are coming on this session for uh, a range of reasons. But some of the themes that I started to see in the text chat were um, you know, really wanting to support your communities and looking for ideas of how to go about doing that. Um, you know, people talked about the reality of the fear that they're facing, wanting access to uh, resources and learning from each other. And I like this idea of not trying to reinvent the wheel, but um, find out how we can be supporting our communities uh, during this time. Um, Ashley and Tori, anything else that you saw in the text chat that you might want to elevate? Thanks, Alicia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just saw a lot about people really, um, you know, concerned about communities and um, thinking of ways to be able to support people who are the most isolated um, and trying to, you know, find ways. How do you reach folks who um, are really isolated right now? Um, and so a lot of concern around um, like mental health and just the impact of, of being isolated during a time like this. Thanks. Lisa, anything you want to add? Um, yeah, I think there's, you know, there's also some concern about people who may be in serious danger. Um, and how to assess that and help people. So um, that's something that we can keep in mind as we um, go through this conference as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important. How do we really meet immediate needs and still think about prevention too? Um, a lot of us on here are usually more focused on prevention. So things today are a little bit different than normal, which I'm excited about. Uh, things are going to move pretty quickly. Uh, we have quite a few guests. Uh, so we have um, five sets. So I know there's six guests, five sets of guests. Uh, we have Hillary and Ursaya from the Center at McKinleyville, who will be sharing about their rapid assessment and work to address immediate needs as a family resource center. We have Jerry from the National Compositors Network who will be discussing um, engaging men and boys in all genders through culturally rooted practice. Um, Jenny from Stop It Now will share about child sexual abuse prevention and safety planning. And then we have Megan from Ujima who will talk about work to prevent violence against women in the black community and work that Megan's been doing through federal policy. And then we'll end off with Vicki from the Hogg Foundation, who will share a regional mental well-being under perspective um, on the current climate. So um, we're going from 
you know, thinking about working directly with families to policy and funders and uh, trying to give a little bit of everything. We're not going to be able to answer all the questions today, of course, but hopefully this is a good starting point and um, we'll see some ideas for moving forward. So Lisa, I'll let you get us started with our first set of guests. Wonderful. Um, so I'm so happy to introduce Hillary and Aristea from the McKinleyville Family Resource Center. Um, and full disclosure, um, we are really lucky to partner with um, the, these two um, in a project called Safety Through Connection this, that is about um, bringing um, leadership, diverse leadership and multi-sector collaboratives um, to um, uh, serve their communities and um, help support healthy relationships. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, could you please tell our guests today uh, just a little bit about um, the McKinleyville Family Resource Center um, and the center at McKinleyville? Oh, you're on mute, Hillary. You have to click your little button. There should be um, at the top right or bottom left of your screen a way to... Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me in. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Center at McKinleyville in Humboldt County is a one-stop location for services, information, and activities for community members. And it was created to address disparities in access to health and social services in rural and tribal communities. Uh, the Center is trying to cultivate inclusion and trust among community members and center partners, increase healthy relationship skills, um, strengthen community beliefs that support safe relationships, mitigate the impacts of poverty and housing insecurity, and initiate change within multiple systems in the community. That's amazing. Um, so what I want to ask you about kind of the unfolding of this pandemic and what was one of the first things that you all did when California instituted a statewide stay-at-home order? Well, we did two things right away uh, that first Monday, right after that happened. Um, the first thing that we did was to uh, reorganize our staff. So of our seven staff members, five went to remote work because they're either in a, a vulnerable population or caring for school-aged children. And uh, the other two of us changed what we were doing to meet what was happening right then. We suspended our volunteer program for the same reason a lot of our volunteers are in a vulnerable population. And um, then we had the first county employees who were reassigned through the disaster um, response assigned to our site. And then the second thing we did was mobilize our reserves. So on that very first day, we were able to take money out of our reserves and say, we're gonna spend this money to respond to this, this pandemic, to this disaster. Um, I think Ariste is trying to join and might be muted. Perhaps um, we can make sure that um, she's unmuted. Ariste, are you there? I there we go. Great. Um, the the other kind of piece of this, which you know, I just want to say as an employee, it was great having kind of a dynamic workplace that was able to respond so quickly and and focus on employee needs. Um, the other piece for us was extending that outward to the community and really trying to understand what are all of the things that are facing the community. Um, so we, we really um, spent a lot of time doing outreach and saying, here's what we do, um, come, come see us so we can provide that to you. And then we realized that um, we also needed to ask people, what do you need? So we put together a really brief, takes about three minute survey um, just saying, what are you struggling with? Um, and having people share their information so that we can start to build a relationship with them with the intention, um, thinking back to your slide that had you know care, connection, and justice, that through the act of care, we can build connections and we can work towards justice going forward with them. I love that. Um, so what were some of the things that you learned from that outreach and conducting this survey? And yeah, what did you learn and what did you do as a result of what you learned? Um, what we found so far, and I'm sure this is gonna change as we go, um, but what we found so far is there are kind of two immediate needs that we're hearing from the community. One is that uh, there are immediate material needs. Um, so things like, baby wipes or um, 
toiletries, you know, shampoo has been hard to get for people who are having a hard time shopping, food, um, bill payment, those sorts of things that we've been able to kind of work with our funders to respond directly. Um, and then there's also this other angle of concern from parents about how they're able to support their kids through this. Um, we had a lot of people actually complete our survey who didn't have material needs, but they are struggling with the idea of homeschooling and the expectations that they're putting on themselves. Um, so we're also trying to figure out how to support from a community perspective, all of these parents and, um, and the kids that they're raising. And Sujita, I think we might have missed a text chat. My apologies for that. What was that? Oh, you're on mute, Alicia. We can just um, put up the text chat question now and ask uh, everyone that's joining us today, you know, hearing a little bit about uh, the assets and needs that came up in McKinleyville. Um, just wondering what assets and needs are coming up in your community. Thank you. And so the way that we've been responding, so Arista has been doing so much great work to try different ways to hear from people uh, what they need. And then what we have been responding to the needs of different uh, populations in the way that they ask. So we've been giving people like access to our food pantry, diapers, wipes, you got about propane, firewood, gasoline, laundry vouchers, cleaning supplies, a whole variety of things. Um, as much as possible, we're trying to give people what it is that they're asking for. And we're doing this because we believe that people are the experts in their own lives. And then the other piece of it, I mean, we always believe that, but the other piece of it is right now, people are really anxious. And if we're able to follow the lead of, of people, it helps it helps uh, people to be able to have a sense of agency in a time when things feel really out of control. Mm -hmm. And Ariste, do you wanna say more about how you're making the connections between how you're responding to communities and how that helps to support families and prevent violence in the home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, our, our primary goal is really to kind of address those major stressors in the home. Um, you know, we know that if people don't have enough food or are concerned about their housing or school or income, um, it increases the risk of violence, right? So trying to meet those basic needs. Um, but then we're also trying to build trust with people so that they can see that, you know, we hear their needs and respond as quickly as they can so that when something serious like intimate partner violence or child abuse comes up, they can work with us, they, they will trust us and our partners. Um, and we're really in it for, for the long haul there. Um, you know, and, and we want to also just be listening for what people need and maybe there's some new innovation out there um, for responding to uh, needs in communities. So speaking of innovation, what kinds of things um, do you think you're gonna be focused on moving forward? I think to me, what's important is um, that nonprofits are prepared and that we have enough money to be able to respond quickly uh, when the time comes. So to have a healthy reserve, to be able to just, just decide on the day that we're, we're gonna spend money towards a need that we see while our um, foundation and other funders are um, trying to figure out when they're ready to respond has been really important. And I think that we there is sometimes this idea that nonprofits need to be scrappy. And if we're too scrappy, then we're not ready to move when it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I would just add that, you know, through my work with the Family Resource Center and also other things like working on a school board, it's, it's about trying to prepare people who are seeing systems for the first time in action um, to be able to recenter in a totally people-focused, wellness-focused way um, and not try to go back to normal because normal wasn't working for so many of us. Um, and try to use this as, as an opportunity to do better for everyone. Hmm. And are you seeing some sort of openness or recognition of that, that what's happening is really sort of human-centered response? Mm -hmm. I, I have seen very little pushback on the idea that we need to kind of 
stop the business as usual piece. And um, I mean, people have just been kind of refocusing their efforts um, and, and chipping in everywhere they can. I know Hillary is, is swamped with volunteers uh, who, who want to help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing what's happening in your community. And I know in many ways you're taking things week by week, um, but it's, it's wonderful to see how connected you are with your community and how um, resilient you are as uh, individuals and as an organization and, and, and supporting uh, resilience in your community in those ways as well. <clears throat> So thank you. Seeing, thank you. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, we're seeing similar things come up in the text chat. Um, we did have one question that I thought maybe we could answer, which was, uh, how did you distribute the survey? Um, with, like, was the link just on your website or where did it, where did you, how did you distribute it? it it's been a, a bit of a trial and error thing. We started in a rolling fashion because we didn't want to get overwhelmed. And so we kind of worked geographically from our location outward. Um, we had our partner school districts send it out. Um, we are partners with, with a lot of different organizations. And so they've been sharing it out. Uh, and then just this week, we launched it into social media, um, which is also a science that I'm learning as we go. <laughs> Great. Thank you for sharing. Great. Um, anything else, Alicia? Nope. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Ariste and Hillary. And um, we're going to keep you on and circle back to you in a minute and move to introduce our next guest. Um, I'm super thrilled and honored to introduce Jerry Teo, who is the founder and the executive director of uh, the National Compadres Network. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Jerry. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, yeah, you and your network. Um, uh, have been an inspiration to me um, for a long time, a uh, positive influence on a lot of prevention institutes work. Um, so for those who um, do, aren't as familiar with your work, can you just tell us a little bit about um, the National Compatriots Network? Yes, well, thank you and uh, greetings and blessings to everyone. Uh, you know, just an honor to be able to connect with people today and just want to acknowledge all, the, all of you that are on this line that are doing amazing work. Um, you know, the work that, that we do at the National Compilers Network started over 30 years ago. I was, had already been working since the 70s on, on issues of uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and, and, uh, and trauma in communities. And, and uh, in the late 80s, uh, myself and Ricardo Carrillo, who is another um, you know, pioneer in the field, we decided that we needed to get together and, and do something to address this issue of violence because uh, what we were obviously finding is a lot of it was perpetrated by men. And, um, and that was a, a very you know, painful thing for us. We're working, but we're seeing men. Uh, and, and the difficult thing is that uh, in the communities we were working is men that look like us. So we decided to, to, to call some men together that were working in the field to uh, to begin to develop programs because nothing was culturally relevant. Everything was very oppressive. And what we're doing is locking up men. We're just locking them up. And, and you know, in, in working uh, together with a lot of women's groups, um, you know, what we were hearing is, you know, they just want men to stop the violence. They want to lock them up. They just want the violence to stop. They want the men to, to change their ways and, and to, to be more compassionate and more sacred and, and uh, have more... Uh, equity and relationships, but didn't want to lock them up. And what we're seeing is a lot of men being incarcerated. So we came together in 1988 and gathered those 19 of us men that came together to um, think about developing programming. And, and not a lot of us didn't know each other because we were different parts of the country. And we began by doing, we call it conocimiento, just to check in to see who are you and what's your intention here. Uh, you know, and, and in, our, in our cultural way, we, we always began by, uh, by asking for uh, acknowledging the ancestors, uh, asking for guidance, uh, you know, starting with prayer. And we did that. And we asked for the ancestors to come in and guide us. And be careful when you do that, because they, they come in with truth. And, and what happened is, as we began to introduce ourselves, uh, we realized that all of us men, even the ones guiding this, were very wounded ourselves. We're doing a lot of work in the community, but we had some generational wounds we hadn't healed. And so what, what we realized at that moment in that circle and that prayer is the most revolutionary thing that we could do was, first of all, heal ourselves. 
to decolonize ourselves, to begin to, to rid ourselves of, of the internalized oppression that some of us carry, even in our professional settings. And so we began to do that and, and decided at that moment that we were going to begin our own healing process, our own reclaiming of our sacredness um, and, and recovering and discovering what that meant. And, and that was the impetus of, uh, of the National Compilers Network 30 some years ago. And we've been on that road since then. We're a national organization that uh, works uh, specifically on regrounding and recapturing and reclaiming uh, sacred relationships in the sense of values and traditions, but also it also means decolonizing and, and addressing some of the oppressive practices and, and false masculinity and uh, all of those things. And so we, uh, our, our focus is, is uh, really uh, training, capacity building, supporting people from across the country, uh, everything with the community, people to uh, people in systems, schools, uh, practitioners dealing a lot in, in, in terms of culturally based trauma-informed healing centered practices. And so that's what we do. Uh, we get called on a lot for men and boys of color, but um, we also have a very strong uh, women and girls uh, division that really guides a lot of the work now. I mean, they really guide us really. Uh, so that's a little bit about us. You can go on our website and really see all the, all the other things that we do. Thank you so much. Talk about getting to the root and um, just thank you for the beautiful work that you do. Um, so I'm, what are, what kinds of things are you seeing, you know, from within your network and how is your network responding? Well, I mean, uh, you know, trauma that is there gets triggered when, uh, when things happen, you know, and so, um, so what we're seeing is, is a lot of triggering going on. And first of all, with, with people that are first responders, people that are service providers, people that are providing the services, you know, we, we give, give, give. It's almost like we exhale, 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 and, and rarely inhale. And so the first thing we had to do is, is reach out, um, first of all, to our staff. And, and we had to circle up ourselves. And even though it was virtually, we had to circle up ourselves and, and check in to see, how are you guys doing? What do you need? How can we help? Uh, and, and call to that inner strength inside of us, you know. Because we're watching, you know, all these news things coming on, seeing, and and we we were really, there was a, there was a feeding of the fear, um, and what we had to really kind of balance that out with the feeding of the faith, and I don't mean religious faith, I mean that spiritual essence of who we are, the sense of you know I, I go outside now and I hear these birds singing, I the, the grass seems greener, the, the sky is bluer, so we know that this is connected to the universe. And we recognize that this is an adjustment. This is a shift. And so we wanted to bring that reality, too. And, and we brought that, uh, that those teachings, our ancestors' teachings, our elders' teachings. You know, the, I mean, and I remember, you know, again, I, I grew up in Compton, black, brown neighborhood. And I remember you walk in the house, grandma said, wash your hands, wash your hands. For you, wash your hands. So, so we had to go back to some old teachings, sit down, be still, okay, stay home. And, and so we're used to things like that you know, in our communities because we would stay home and stay inside when, uh, you know, if you talk about immigrant populations and, you know, they have had to hunker down and stay inside because of, you know, racist policies by ICE and things like that. And, and in neighborhoods that are disenfranchised, you know, we stay inside where cops are around. You know, so we, we, this, is, this is not new to us. It just triggers us in a different way, you know. And so we had to begin reaching out to, you know, we have a network of people that we've trained all across the country on on trauma-informed, healing-centered, culturally-based practices, and we began reaching out to them and began uh, holding, this was strange to us too, virtual healing circles, you know, virtual meditation. I mean, how do you do that over a computer, you know? But we had to uh, trust that the spirit could reach across uh, uh, computers, that if you, if you share intention and if you share it in good ways or share a song or share you know, some poetry or share, you know, some music in a good way. And, and uh, you know, a number of us do this healing practice. So we begin sharing on our social media meditations that are helping people to sleep and deal with anxiety. We begin to share, you know, songs and poetry that help to ground people in that way. And we encourage people, what, what, what grounds you? What helps you? You know, what kind of food makes you feel comfortable? You know, let, let's reach into those things now. And so that's what we began doing. I mean, obviously, we had to adjust a lot of our work because we do a lot of work in person. Our training, our capacity is in person and we do it across the, the country. And so we had to shift that and, 
and began to, you know, figure out how we could do this in a, in a good way. So that's some of the shifting that we've done, uh, you know, and we're learning though, you know, and, and I'll just say that, that the women have taught us, you know, uh, what's going on with a lot of the women and they're sharing and what we're, we're meeting is they're saying that they're on the phone uh, texting uh, all day. And, and what we've heard from a lot of the women is, is, is that, you know, they, they don't kill, they, they're not, uh, they don't have any space because their partners are around, their children are around, so they can't talk, they can't be on video chats, they can't be on all of that because they have no privacy. So they text. And so, so, so a lot of women are texting all day, doing text counseling all day long, right? And, and sending these emojis and, you know, all these things that can kind of, uh, and, and so, you know, we're learning about how do we stay connected? You know, how do we stay connected that way and supporting one another? Um, what we're doing now in terms of, you know, re, um, kind of regrounding and, and we'll be having a webinar on what is men's role? What are the, the role of men in this time? you know, of, of uh, you know, of, of insecurity, uh, because, you know, it, it triggers a lot of, you know, we have a lot of men that we work with, too, that are formerly incarcerated. Uh, and, you know, even though now they're out, they still have wounds. And so how do we uh, do that? And, and, you know, the interesting thing is we don't think about sports as being a curative factor. But, you know, for a lot of people, you know, sports was it was a coping mechanism. And when you don't have that, it's like, now, what do I do? Right. So it's it's just interesting all these little things that that begin to creep up and crop up and mm -hmm. and it's because we haven't dealt with the trauma we haven't focused enough energy on intergenerational trauma on on you know gender and and uh, you know and cultural trauma uh, we haven't we haven't focused on that we haven't invested in that so now in vulnerable, vulnerable times it creeps up. Thank you so much. Um, it's just so clear to me that in you know, that you're bringing forward the cultivation of these relationships, this healing work, this network um, that you've been doing for 30 years now. And um, uh, there've been lots of uh, messages in the text chat, thanking you, uh, interest in connecting with you um, and wanting to learn more about your approach. And um, clearly this is a very special network that you have. Um, we have about just about one minute. And I'm just curious if you have advice to people who are not part of such a network, but want to um, support um, their communities in a similar way. Um, you know, what advice do you have for them of like what they might be able to do in this moment? Well, I, I think, you know, we, we focus and it's, it's definitely, we do a lot of social advocacy and, and, and gesture, justice advocacy too. And that, and that external work and the political work is real important, but it's really important to do as much internal work that we do as much internal work as we do external work. So we have focused a lot on having people um, build networks based on relationships. You know, uh, we're doing a lot of healing circles right now virtually. And I suggest that be a significant part of the work, you know, um, and, and, you know, we at the National Compilers, we do a lot of training on how to do these things. That's, we're training capacity building uh, um, organization. And so, um, you know, I reach out to us, you know, and, and we can share what we do. Uh, we'll be, um, a lot of the stuff that we were doing in person now, we'll be doing virtually as well. So we have a lot of resources, you know, that, that focus on, um, you know, families on, on men, on women, but also on children. We're doing a lot of work in schools. And one, let me, I want to share two concerns. I just want to lift up. One concern is uh, we're now confronted with issues of how do you grieve with the deaths that are going on, with not being able to, to be with that person when they cross over, you know, the, the, the difficulty. But the other thing is that how do you grieve? Because the, 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 you can't do a funeral. Um, and so we're doing grieving service. The last thing um, that is real important is children return to school and teachers are not prepared. So we're doing a lot of uh, preparation. And, and I, I just suggest in your communities, if you reach out to, to schools, we're doing a lot of training for schools around what do you do when the children return? Because they're going to be layered with trauma and all of that. I want to thank all of you and, and just all of those people on this call for, um, 
for what you do. Make sure you take care of yourself. And that's the last mm-hmm. thing, our own self-care. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. And um, we are getting uh, a few questions. Um, we're going to move to our next speaker um, and we will um, circle back and respond to some of those questions as much as we can as we move forward. Um, But thank you so much. And um, we'll come back to you um, toward the end again. So now it is um, my pleasure to introduce Jenny Coleman, who's the director of Stop It Now. I've also been a longtime fan of Stop It Now's work, and I'm not surprised that you all are um, stepping up with such relevant resources right now. Um, But for folks who are not familiar with Stop It Now, Jenny, can you Um, just say a little bit about your organization and the work that you do. Absolutely. And thank you, Lisa. And I I need to say first, I'm feeling so humbled by the chat, by the comments Mm -hmm. and what people are doing and and the needs. So thank you. And thank you, Jerry, as well. Um, Yet Stop It Now is a national organization. We focus on the prevention of child sexual abuse through mobilizing adults, families, and communities to take actions to protect children before they're harmed. We really focus on adult accountability and responsibility. And to support folks, we have a number of services, um, including our public educational materials, uh, webinars. We do training across the country and internationally, and our helpline, which is a toll-free confidential phone line, email, and chat service, and social media where folks, anyone at all, who have concerns about a child's sexual safety can uh, reach out and and ask their questions confidentially. Great, thank you. And um, looking forward to learning more about the resources that you're offering, but I just wanted to say that I did see an article that mentioned that the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network Hotline has been seeing an uptick in minors reporting sexual violence in March. And I'm just seeing, curious about kind of what you're seeing um, in terms of the impact of the pandemic. Yeah, I saw that article too. I also have been seeing many articles talking about state um, hotlines through child protection services that are seeing declines. Mm-hmm. We're not seeing either an incline, uh, an increase or a decrease, which is not strange to us. We often don't see, our numbers go down during vacation times. What we know is when parents are busy, occupied, their plates are full, it's not easy for them to reach out for help. We also know that the professionals who typically have eyes on kids and maybe the first folks to reach out with a question about a child's safety don't have eyes on those kids right now. Um, so we, what we're hearing is, I guess, I don't know whether this is unfortunately or to be expected, but we're seeing the same types of concerns about children's sexual behaviors, adult sexual behaviors, vulnerable environments as we always see. What we know is that um, the concerning behaviors, the worries that people have uh, don't stop in a pandemic, they don't stop in a crisis. They're still happening and they may be louder within the home, but in terms of folks being able to reach outside for guidance, there's more barriers than there were before to help folks do that. We certainly are seeing though an increase in uh, pornography use and that includes in folks who are seeking underage um, pornography, um, who are looking for child sexual abuse imagery, what we know is that we don't know everything that we that people are experiencing in the homes, that folks are isolated, that what they may have been seeing before that may be louder to them when they're not having such a full plate and worrying about food and housing and economic security is that it's harder for them to know how to respond to early warning signs. We're not sure about how folks are able to manage so much on their plates. So as parents are working at home, having to ask um, older kids to watch younger kids, we have a lot of situations where um, kids are together and their behaviors are becoming more visible in terms of um, kind of just bored and, and curiosity, but they're beginning to cross boundaries. So the questions that we are getting, if they are related to COVID-19 are, I think my kids are bored and I'm seeing their behaviors kind of push up against each other and they're starting to cross boundaries. When is the appropriate time to intervene? Mm -hmm. Oh, and one other thing I want to add that's really important because our helpline also does speak to adults who are looking to keep themselves accountable. And we are hearing a little bit more from these folks that without their regular routines and structures, 
they're struggling more with some of their safety planning around their own behaviors to make sure that they're safe. They may be um, more triggered um, by their isolation. They may be seeking out um, uh, kind of borderline material online, and they are reaching out for help um, to help them during this time. Um, thank you for sharing what you're seeing and, and certainly some, you know, really concerning um, issues that you're bringing up. And um, I appreciate um, Stop It Now's kind of skillfulness in offering some very practical um, suggestions for people. Um, so can you, and I know you're, you know, you've, you're creating these Facebook um, videos, short videos to give people tips. Can you share some um, recommendations or guidance that you might have just in a couple minutes um, of, you know, how people can uh, provide support to families around some of these issues that might be of concern? Absolutely. First of all, really important to make sure families have hope that there is help available. Really want to encourage folks to please share Stop It Now's helpline because we are open so if folks have questions. But really, um, it is the conversation that people can have with the families they serve around their safety plans. Being um, as aware of cultural values, family practices and beliefs to help families think about rules around boundaries and respect in their home that may need to be adapted as their families are, are together for extended periods of times and you know, in four walls. So to really help folks think through what are some of the safety rules in their home that they need to encourage and emphasize. Encouraging parents to, to um, take care of themselves, encouraging telehealth when possible, and encouraging connection. We know that isolation is just, you know, the water that makes child sexual abuse unfortunately grow. So the more that we can connect with folks, whether it's snail mail, whether it's postcards, whether it's videos, whether it's phone calls or texting, to take all opportunities and all avenues to make sure folks are feeling uh, connected and seen. Um, really helping folks encourage uh, by encouraging conversation, asking parents not to ignore the low level behaviors, but that uh, to help them begin to address those, not only in children, but also in adults, asking adults, hey, how are you doing around privacy? How are you doing around uh, boundaries? Is there anything that you're finding struggle uh, as a struggle when um, you know, you are um, engaged with others in terms of what's okay to say, what's okay, how to um, talk about concerns that you have, helping folks really identify any confusion they may have around sexual relationships and boundaries. And just making sure that messages are really clear about safety, that it's important that people are safe, it's important that folks feel like they can ask for help, and that we also need to be really mindful that some of the conversations we would typically have may have to be postponed because we have to understand um, our own instinct and gut that says it's not safe to raise a concern right now. So I always want to encourage folks to make sure they are listening to that instinct when it doesn't feel safe to talk about sexual behaviors in the family. Mm. Thank you so much for um, that very practical guidance. And um, I just love the notion of promoting safety plans. Um, and you know, you're giving us a lot to think about in terms of the kinds of things that we should include in safety planning. And it seems like it has a lot of relevance to other issues that might be coming up in the home as well to talk about relationships and connection and boundaries and um, how we're taking care of ourselves and, um, and each other. So thank you for sharing those recommendations. And um, thank you, um, Jenny. And um, now we're going to, I'm going to turn it um, back to Alicia to help us um, carry the conversation forward with a few more guests. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so next, I have the honor of introducing Megan, who is a senior policy attorney at Ujima. And um, Megan, I just want to do a quick sound check. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good. Great. Good. Okay. Um, Great. Can, you, can you share a little bit about Ujima and how the pandemic has uh, affected the communities that you work with? So thank you again for having me. Um, like you said before, I am a policy attorney at Ujima Inc., which is the um, 
National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. We're a culturally specific organization, and we are a project of DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, Wow. Uh, the pandemic, I mean, I know many of you have, have been hearing about some of the uh, increase in numbers as it relates to African Ameri the African-American community, um, as it relates to the pandemic and the increasing amount of deaths. Um, a lot of that has been associated in particularly with um, comorbid comorbidities as well as um essentially pre-existing conditions. Um, just making sure that, you know, the community has the information um, and we try to keep it as current as we possibly can. Um, we do have, um, you know, we have several different in emphasis. Um, public health is one of them, but really centering that at this time, seeing as though that our community is being, um, you know, it, it, there has been such an increase um, and, you know, we, we just are making sure that we're centering those things. Um, also, uh, I spent a lot of time with Black Maternal Health and just kind of providing additional information. Um, many of you may know that this is Black Maternal Health Week, um, but again, just providing any information that we can for folks um, being that, you know, in particular, Black pregnant people have um, high conditions uh, of um, excuse me, bias and um, disregard of pain and all of those things coupled with all of the um, continued difficulties with this uh, current pandemic. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, oh. Thank you for sharing. Uh, in the past week, um, there's definitely been a lot more news coverage that I've been seeing about this and, uh, you know, really talking about the impact of coronavirus on Black communities. And I hope that that'll help us move towards addressing these inequities sure. uh, in the long term to really support health and safety. Um, but as a policy attorney, I'm curious how your work has um, shifted during this time. There's been some shifts. Um, what I do is front facing a lot of days. And so um, obviously we are, well, not we, we are exercising social distancing. So we have been working from home for the past um, few weeks. Reaching out, much of what I've been doing is reaching out to staff member at um, Capitol Hill just to see if there's anything we can do to assist them, um, making sure that I am abreast of current policy like the CARES Act. Um, and doing as much as we can to break that information down. It can be very language heavy. And with all the information that folks are getting, um, they really just want to know how is this going to impact me? How is this going to impact my family? You know, what support is going to be provided and just kind of breaking some of that information down. Um, in particular, I spent some time specifically with the stimulus check, just making sure people understood, um, had an, an understanding of, you know, how the checks were going to be dispersed. Um, it's ever changing. You know, when I first started writing and providing information, um, everything was definitely going to be done, you know, there, di through direct deposits. Um, so there was a lot of concern because, you know, folks are like, you know, what if I don't, what if I don't have a checking account? You know, what if um, I am, you know, not someone that had filed taxes? How am I going to be getting this information? How am I going to be getting these funds? And am I even eligible for these funds? So just making sure that I, that I am staying abreast on the policy and to ensure that folks know that, um, you know, there is help out there, there are resources, and making sure that um, we lift our voices to make sure that, you know, in the event that these things are overlooked, i.e. some communities or some folks still don't use banking accounts, um, some folks still function in cash, making sure, you know, we are, um, or, or go to check cash, cashing places and the like, making sure that people know what their options are. That's great. As, so, yeah, as, like an really... <laughs> as an yeah. example. As an example. And a myriad of other things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to kind of help provide that bridge between what's happening in federal policy with what needs are coming up in the community. And it sounds like you've been able to help bridge some of those things. Um, now, as an organization that focuses on 
preventing violence against the black community, um, preventing violence against women in the black community. Why are things like the, what you just mentioned uh, important and important to preventing violence in the home? Um, so studies have shown that there has been an uptick in violence in the home in the event that there, there is economic insecurity, um, you know, in accordance with the flies and much of the information that we have, um, you know, more than 80% of black mothers are breadwinners in their homes. And so these folks are, um, frontline workers or they've been laid off. Um, you know, you're already providing stressors. Um, in a home that's already been stressed. So that's why it's very important in the event that, you know, these, many of these homes, which can be economically disadvantaged, you know, they know what resources are out there so they can go ahead and take advantage of them to kind of stabilize the home as quickly as possible. Um, Obviously it's not a fix all and it doesn't address the violence. Um, But again, you know, it can provide some resources in hopes that, people are aware of what's out there so they can be, uh, they're, they're able to, you know, manage bills and, you know, that the housing situation doesn't also become unstable and the like. Thank you for sharing and making those connections that uh, are really important to be focusing on. Um, so Megan, we'll have you come back at the end as well, but uh, we're gonna move on to our next guest. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so next we have Vicki from the Hogg Foundation. Hi, Vicki. Good afternoon. I had to unmute my mic. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. As you see, I've been uh, forgetting to do that today, too. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, so Vicki Vicki's at the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health, um, which is a Texas-based foundation that focuses on transforming mental health through community. And Prevention Institute is very fortunate to be working uh, with Hogg on an initiative called Communities of Care. Uh, and that's focused on mental well-being of children, youth, and families in the greater Houston area. And so it's really nice to have Vicki here today um, would love to hear from you on kind of a funder perspective. Um, what's been top of mind for you with this pandemic and the work you're doing? And also, if you want to say anything about your foundation, uh, please also do so. Sure. So we are a Texas-based funder. So we only fund in Texas, um, and we focus primarily on mental health and well-being. We are thrilled that we're partnering with Prevention Institute as our coordinator for our Houston-based grant and just very grateful and honored to be on the call this afternoon with so many people who are doing such great work and being so supportive of people during such difficult times. So as a funder, as you can imagine, uh, for us, our, our challenges and thoughts are a little different because our jobs are primarily deciding and identifying ways that we can provide money and financial support um, to organizations such as many of that are that are on the call that are doing such great work throughout the country. So top of mind for us really, um, and things I think that funders have to really think about during these times, and I can speak primarily for the foundation, but also on behalf of kind of a national movement or thoughts around how foundations as as a whole can be supportive. It's real important during these times for us to be available, mostly for us to know during a time that um, most of us as funders are working remotely, we need to make sure that our grant partners know that we're still working, first of all, and most of all, that we're available for them. So we've worked really hard to try, try to make sure that we are proactively communicating with our grantees and potential um, grantees to make sure that they know that we're still here and that we still are offering the same level of support that we had before this crisis. And depending on the number of grantees, this could be done either virtually, we've done that through town hall meetings that we've had, and we've even had online office hours so that people can just kind of pop in and ask questions and get support to answers that they might have Um, over how things are going up in terms of the status of their grants. So now more than ever, um, I think as organizations, nonprofits, people need to know that the funding is still available. And if not, um, unfortunately, in some cases, just the status of their funding. And so again, communicating is very important. 
It's also a good practice that um, makes sure that people have our contact information, they have our cell or our home office numbers, and are aware of any changes that we've made in, as a result of, these, of the current crisis. And then um, at a minimum, we should uh, check in with our grantees via email and via phone or video conferences, just to make sure that we're, they know again that we're available. It's also real important to us during this time to be very flexible because things are constantly changing and we need to be responsive to that and understand that the goals and grant the goals and objectives of grants that we may have originally funded may look very, very different now and that we need to shift maybe to be able to support our grantees and being able to address the more emergent needs, as well as grant timelines and grant terms. Those may need to shift um, because some people may be out ill. There may be some staffing changes or office uh, shortages. So just being mindful of that. Another way we're being flexible is just being open and allowing an extension for reports uh, and deliverables and our, as far as timelines and when things are due. And in addition, being able to offer some alternative formats, perhaps for people to be able to submit reports. They may look a little different in terms of how they submit the reports. They may be um, recording something or video conferences rather than the typical um, written report or even just doing some updates and reports over the phone. And then recognizing that even some events that have been scheduled like conferences or meetings, we had one that we were several meetings we were doing in person and we switched those to, to be more of a video conferencing format and possibly in some of those have had to cancel them all together. So lastly, we also wanna make sure that our internal process, so when we need to release grant payments, we can do so as quickly as possible because we understand people need to have access to their funds quickly now. We also wanna be very responsive in addition uh, to being available. It's important that we really listen to what our grant partners are saying is important. Um, are there infrastructure needs for perhaps for an organization that needs support or are there staffing changes or shifted responsibilities due to the recent crisis? Um, but most of all, it's about listening to their concerns and their fears and being conscious as a funder that we, there is a power differential there and that we need to create an environment where grantees can be candid and honest and ask us for what they really need without fear of being judged or concerned that their uh, funding might be at risk if they're truly honest about what their challenges are right now. We wanna be strategic. Um, yes, I'm sorry. We want to be strategic and make sure that we are um, centering our work and our efforts around uh, making sure that we're hearing from people who have been excluded traditionally and that their voices are being included and we're hearing specifically what their needs are rather than just hearing from the people that we fund as our or nonprofit organization. And mostly we want to accept feedback and suggestions because we recognize we don't have all the answers and we don't know how to uh, address all the needs that are there, but we wanna be able to be responsive and we wanna hear and get suggestions and feedback about how we can be more um, helpful. And then lastly, as a funder, we wanna be informative. We want to um, utilize our leverage um, as a funder to um, use our position of influence and to provide information to legislators about needed changes that are gonna be needed in the coming months and years and that have been needed over time, just haven't been addressed to support our vulnerable populations and people who have not been supported um, at the level in which they've needed that. Um, we also wanna make sure that um, since we have expertise in some different areas like public health and education or working with specific regions or populations, we want to create, and we have created uh, resources and information available on our website so that our potential grantee partners are aware of upcoming, upcoming funding opportunities, um, as well as just information and current and accurate news um, that can keep them up to date about the changes as they're going on. As far as- Wow, Vicki, you sound, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, that's fine. No, no, I was just gonna say, it sounds like your foundation's really thinking comprehensively about your approach to this? You know, we've really tried to, um, this is new for us as a funder um, and not, uh, of course, not addressing or responding to a crisis, but it's definitely a, a different level of crisis than we're used to. 
As far as a nonprofit organization, um, it's important that you also recognize that you have a voice and that we encourage you as funders to approach your funders um, and to find out kind of what things are going on with them right now. It makes sense to start with people and funders that you have relationships with currently. Um, so reaching out to uh, foundations where your organization already has a relationship with or maybe already receives funding from, uh, either through email uh, or calling them. It also is important if you share with them what you've been doing specifically to support your specific population of focus during these times, because that gives us an idea of kind of what work you're doing um, and what's been taking place so far. Um, we also encourage you to be transparent. This is a time again where I think people are, are, are seeking kind of truth of what's going on and who better to tell us what those challenges are than, than you that are directly working with um, individuals and communities. And so if you feel comfortable and supported, it's important that you share your concerns with your funder and at, just ask them how flexible can they be in terms of their current funding and what the process, like, it, process is if you're seeking additional support and funding at this time. Um, I know I'm talking a lot, kind of throwing a lot of things out. I'm sorry, Alicia, if you had any questions or wanted to chime in. No, I think that's all great um, and really helpful because I think, you know, a lot of the people on the uh, line right now are probably more in the like nonprofit mm -hmm. than funder realm. And so hearing from a funder directly about some ideas of how to approach a funder and maybe you've been a little bit nervous about doing so is, is really helpful. Yeah, I think it's real important, again, just to be real transparent and maybe before you approach a funder, identify what your needs are and think about what it is that you're really needing during this time, whether that's in, internal or infra infrastructure support, or if it's specific activities or ways that you want to ask. I know a lot of people mentioned on the call that, or I saw in the chat that you're supporting communities with diapers and food and just different things that are the basic needs that I think people are struggling with right now. So being honest, I think as a funder, we recognize that there is gonna be a shift in what people are asking for. And so if there is flexible funding available, um, which is what we strongly support and encourage, that making that easy to access, um, but it's, it's important to know what you're needing and what your community and what your ask is before approaching your funder. Um, and have an idea with a high level budget and a potential cost estimate for what you're requesting uh, from the funder, it's real important. And then, right. go ahead. And, and you mentioned um, that you're part of a movement of funders. Do you wanna quickly tell us about that? Sure, so um, there is through the Council of Foundations, this um, push or in strong encouragement for as leaders in philanthropy for us to recognize the real critical need that's being, um, that's taking place right now with this, with this a serious health crisis that we're a part of. So the Council of Foundations has been um, very thoughtful about pulling together leaders in philanthropy and trying to um, get us to all sign on. So they have a pledge you can sign on to as a foundation that you are going to um, follow um, and support some, some specific um, thoughts they have around funding. And so just some of the things that I mentioned about being flexible and having responsive funding and just being transparent, those were just a few of the things that they identify as important uh, for funders to think about during this time. Thank you, Vicki. This is really helpful. People in the chat are also saying that it's uh, been really informative and helpful, so appreciate that. And we're now going to bring back um, all of our guests. And Lisa, I'll let you talk us through this slide. Sure. Um, so, wow, what a, how amazing to have such a diverse community um, joining us today and guests who are connected to their communities in different ways and contributing to what's needed right now in different ways. And we really wanted to honor that and um, share this visual of roles in a social change ecosystem. This was created by Deepa Iyer with Solidarity Is and the Building Movement Project. And this image you know, represents just some of the roles that we can pursue um, in 
uh, some of the roles that we can play in pursuit of equity and liberation and inclusion and justice. Um, within our organizations, you can think about different roles that people can play or within our networks or within our neighborhoods, our communities and our movements. Um, and she offers a self-reflection guide um, and a guide that can um, help in all those other types of settings um, to cultivate this kind of a um, diverse and robust ecosystem for social change. So we know that, you know, we can't do everything, but that's not what is called for. Um, we can, we're part of these ecosystems that are creating change together. Now, I know that we're all in different geographies um, and that sort of thing, but on the next slide, we wanted to put out a text chat question. We think that there's still things that we can be doing collectively. And so we just wanna ask how can people on this call today, how can we support each other? And what could be our collective call to action? And I know one of the things that people have been posting about in the chat that they're wanting extra support in is uh, just making sure that the links that are being shared today in the text chat uh, come out in a resource document. And uh, Ashley, Tori, that, do you wanna just share where people will be able to find that? Sure, Alicia. Um, so we will absolutely make that more accessible for folks, all of the resources that have been shared today. And we'll send an email um, with a link to that, as well as a link to the um, recording of the web conference, and hopefully in just the next couple of days. Okay. And it seems like one of the call, one of the uh, requests is something that is easy to maneuver with the resources, something that's uh, compiled in a consolidated in a way. So we'll see what we can do there. Um, but with this text chat question, and as folks are starting to uh, chime in, we want to take it back to our guests and uh, ask, you know, um, our guests today, what do you want to ask of others? And what should our collective call to action be? And so, um, Jerry, if you want to start off and share. Well, um, I, I believe, first of all, we need to um, take care of ourselves and I think honor ourselves and honor the, 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 the a great teaching right now that is going on uh, in this shift. And it's really about the significance of our sacred relationships, not only to ourselves, but to nature and to everything around that we need to appreciate. It's calling us to break down barriers and borders and, uh, and really... Uh, be, become more interdependent uh, uh, with everything we do. And so I would, I would say, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was talking with some young people and telling them right now we need all our energy to heal. So we need to release any energy that is about uh, any past resentment or hurt or anything like that. We need to release that because we need the energy to heal and go forward in a good way. So I would say that. Thanks, Jerry. And um, quickly, we did have a question earlier. People were wondering how you do virtual healing circles and wondering if there's anything that you could share about that. Yeah, we're wondering about that, too. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, this is this is not something that I would think that we would do. I mean, because part of my tradition is you know, it's relationships and you meet with people and, and gather with people. But we know that um, that, you know, these are important times. and so. Um, you know, um, we uh, we are providing some guidance about how to gather people in a good way and still honor traditions and honor culture and honor ways. Uh, so check our website and see when we're, you know, we'll be doing some webinars and some some guidance on that as well about how to do that in a good way and still maintain a certain um, honoring of traditions and honoring of, of, of sacred ways as well. But we need to be able to connect. Uh, I'll say one thing that we're now working on is um, we're realizing that when you're doing a lot of Zoom calls, it takes a lot of energy. And so we need to be careful with that because, you know, when you're with people, uh, the energy comes back. When you're in a Zoom call, the energy doesn't necessarily come back. And so we need to balance that as well and think about e even balancing that kind of stuff. I completely agree. Yeah, Zoom calls and being on video is a different, really is a kind of drains the energy level sometimes. So appreciate you calling that out. Um, Hersia and Hillary, anything that you want to share here? 
Uh, I, I just want to add um, that one, one thing that we've been working really hard to clarify with the community is, you know, all of those people who um, are trying to find places to help now, um, we're really working to make sure that people are connecting into existing organizations. Um, we've encountered quite a few people trying to reinvent the wheel right now. And there's already so many great um, nonprofits and other agencies um, that have places that they might need you or the people that you know. So um, it, it would be helpful for us if everybody on this call would help connect um, people in their lives to organizations um, so that we can amplify the, the networks that are already in existence. Like that. I agree with Aristea. Also, I'd say um, for us to decide that we're not going to go back to normal when this is over. for sharing that. Um, Jenny, anything you'd like to add? I, I would. I want to say that the power of hope is so important and that we need to continue to share that. Um, and to do that, we can share the ways that we have been reaching out, the success stories, the connections are really powerful. We can help each other learn more about safe behaviors and warning signs and how to speak up and to use our voices. And then finally, just on a bigger level, I would ask folks to reach out to um, their Congress members to fund state and local prevention and child welfare systems during this pandemic to really make sure that CAPTA and Family First and many other bills um, are funded so folks can get, uh, you know, can get this, the support and assistance they need. Thanks, Jenny. I just want to see if any of our other guests would like to say anything here. Sure. Um, this is Megan. Uh, just continuing to try to connect with one another. And, um, you know, I had an experience about a week ago where I was supposed to be planning a um, forum with someone else. And she was kind of at a point where she was ready to um, basically scrap the project. And I was like, well, wait, you know, I think there are some things we can do virtually um, that will allow us to speak while will also allow members of the audience to speak and have an opportunity. You know, let's consider some other things. So just being um, still being I know we we are all probably zoomed out um, at this point, but um, just you know, keeping your eyes and ears out when you do, when we do um, join these calls or join these webinars or podcasts or any, any other um, vehicles for um, <clears throat> engagement and communication, that we take that back to other, organiza other organizations, do teachbacks and share that information um, at a time where, you know, at, at, at this point, we're just not sure when we will go back to a time where we're not intentionally socially distancing ourselves um, so that we can continue to do the work, just do it a little differently for the time being. Mm -hmm. If I can mention one other thing, uh, Ms. Jerry, um, you know, I think, um, you know, we're, we're trying to reach out to men um, because I think that it triggers a lot of things for men as well. And, and, um, you know, and, and I think that also relies, connects to boys as well, that, uh, that really we need to invest more in terms of healing men, because during these stressful times, all the woundedness comes out and then they wound others more. And so um, I think we need, you know, to really focus on the healing uh, men and healing boys. And, 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 and the other thing is children. Uh, more funds to be able, not just for the regular systemic stuff of mental health, but preparing parents and preparing caregivers and preparing uh, community folks to uh, to really be able to nurture children and identify. Uh, what's, what we're seeing a lot of is uh, parents not knowing what to do with their teenage kids because they're not around them that much, but now they're, they're the, the teenagers are in the home and they're seeing some manifestations of what they don't see because they're usually out with their friends or out 
you know, at school or whatever. And, and so we need uh, some investment in terms of how do we you know, heal our communities and, and reintegrate some of those, uh, the, the, the positive cultural practices uh, that, uh, that many times in those difficult times have sustained us uh, you know, in the past. Great. Thank you. Um, so if we go to our next slide, uh, you know, there's been great dialogue in the chat, and uh, we just would like to know in what ways you'd like to see these sorts of dialogues continue. And I already saw someone in the text chat was saying maybe doing something like this, but where there's more opportunity for interaction between all the participants. That's one idea. Um, we're also planning to summarize this web conference into um, a short piece, written piece, but would love to know what other ways you would like to see these sorts of dialogues continue. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, we wanna go to our resources section here. And uh, I know on the Prevent Connect web conference last week, you know, there was discussion about, there's so many resources out there, um, so many things to be looking at, so we're trying our best not to overload too much, but wanted to share a few things. So on the intimate partner violence and gender-based violence prevention front, uh, we thought that we would share uh, this blog from Prevent IPV. And I think I saw Casey's on right now. So nice to see you, Casey, um, who wrote the blog. And uh, also we wanted to share something from Teachers Without Violence which has a bunch of compiled resources. We thought that might be a good approach rather than each individual thing. Um, on the next slide, uh, focusing on child abuse prevention and ending violence against children, we wanted to share um, this link here. It includes um, on their list of resources, they even have some things from the WHO about supporting positive parenting, and it's translated into a number of languages. Uh, so that's also another resource. And Stop It Now has done some recent email um, alerts that went out to their listeners, one on online safety planning during COVID-19. And I know someone was asking about safety planning earlier on, so definitely check out Stop It Now's website. Um, and then the next, slide. Some other items to mention. I just said that we had a Prevent Connect web conference last week and there's a recording from that. Um, and yeah, lots of things to come back to. Uh, we will definitely be sharing the compiled resource list that's easier to access because I know the text chat, has, we're having some troubles with copying and pasting off of it. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, oh, one last slide here. Uh, we also wanted to just share some of the types of messages that we've been seeing on social media by different organizations. So close to home, San Luis Obispo in California has been highlighting local stories um, from the community and uh, highlighting different people that are still working and um, sharing, kind of bringing the community together through their social media. We've also seen things like uh, groups talking about mindfulness and the importance of self-care. And uh, yeah, lots that people have been posting through their social media and also thinking about how sexual assault awareness month. And to close us out today, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa. Thanks, Alicia, and thank you, everyone. And um, there were lots of great questions and offerings in the text chat, and we will definitely um, circle back to those. So thank you. We'll compile them and you know find ways to share them back out. Um, really good questions and really good resources that people um, were exchanging. So thank you for that. And um, I wanted to just um, end with this quote, end, but the conversation will continue in many ways. So this is from um, 350.org and my editions are in green. Um, this is a time to be decisive in saving lives and preventing violence and bold in advocating for what we need for genuinely healthier, safer and more equitable futures through a just recovery. So, um, on that note, and with, with that intention of both boldness uh, in this moment and continued um, work together, 
um, through 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 the recovery and into our futures. Um, just thank you, uh, a sincere gratitude from from me and from the team at Prevention Institute. Thank you so much, Lisa, um, Alicia, Bina. Thank you so much to all of our guests and for all of you in the audience. Um, and Tori, of course, thank you as well. Um, we are so just humbled to have shared this experience with you all. Um, and we will be getting those resources out to you in the coming days. So thank you again for joining us today, for sharing, um, and for being part of this community. And we will talk soon. Be well, everyone. Take care. Have a um, good rest of your Tuesday.